Intro me. Intro music. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is going into the scientific editor series. And I'm very happy to have scientific editor and lead editor Leon Golub with us today. Hey, Leon. Hi there. How are you today? I'm just fine. Just fine. Super duper. Uh, I actually was in Harvard Square yesterday, walked down from the observatory. First time I've been there in about a year, I think. That is great. Met, met some visiting colleagues. We sat and had coffee. It was a uh, thrilling experience. That is amazing. That's great. Yeah, it's been well over a year since I visited any sort of eating establishment. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, I wish you many more of those. <laughs> slowly, slowly getting back to normal. So have you have you been back to your office since uh, since things happened? Um, access is restricted. Okay. Um, you need permission to go in. Uh, if you have to be in a lab to do your work, uh, you can be, and you have to be tested uh, weekly. Uh, I can do my work from home uh, as long as I have internet connections. I've been going in about one day a month, mm -hmm. mainly to pick up mail. And... That's 10 times more frequent than I've been going in. <laughs> I haven't been in my office in about a year now. Um, amazingly, I have a laptop there that is that is still up and going. Uh, which is important for me because it's uh, it's a gateway of faster transfers of various things I need to do between institution and home. So that that little laptop just keeps chugging um, after a whole year without one reboot. So it's pretty good. I'm happy about that. So Leon, that's a very awesome bookshelf you have off to your left. And so let me ask you, what do you like to do for research? My research. Um, I guess, broadly speaking, it's the dynamics of hot magnetized astrophysical plasmas. Mm -hmm. And that's inherently a messy subject. <laughs> plasmas are bad enough if you magnetize them and then you vary the magnetic field. It, it's awesome how complicated it can get. And uh, mainly, I do this work uh, by looking at the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also worked with solar type stars, which extends the range of parameter space you can deal with. Uh, the sun is just one example. You have stars that are more active, less active, rotate faster, different spectral types. So you can test theories that you develop on the sun by looking at uh, what you think other stars ought to be doing and find out whether they're doing it or not. And uh, more often than not, uh, there are surprises when you do that. Indeed, there are. Indeed. So I'm always curious how, uh, how people get into the research field that they do, given that there's so many you know, choices and options. So, so how did you get into this field? You know, I sometimes feel that my life has been defined by a series of random events. Lots of them. <laughs> okay. So which, which random ones led you into, into solar and plasma physics? Uh, I got a degree, uh, graduate school at MIT. I did high energy physics, yeah. uh, particle accelerators. Ah. Uh, I was involved in measuring the Compton cross section at six GeV. That was high energy back in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I decided af after doing that, that I, I didn't like big experiments that take a long time that involve a lot of people were an individual person typically only has one little part of the experiment. Mm -hmm. And ironically, I'm now doing space physics, which has exactly that character. 
<laughs> but the way I got into it. So I was writing my thesis. Uh, in those days, there was a drafting department of people that uh, made the drawings for you, for your thesis. Mm, very nice. One of the draftsmen asked me what I was going to do when I graduated. I told him, well, you know, I don't really know. And he said, well, there's a group down the street. Wow. Uh, people from MIT started up this little research company, and you might want to go talk to them. That was American Science and Engineering. Okay. Uh, the research group was headed by Ricardo Giacconi. Okay. So I, I got an interview with them. We liked each other. Uh, I didn't talk to Ricardo. He, he was, you know, a few levels up from the level I was uh, at. Uh, but the person who interviewed me, also named Leon, Uh, okay, we lost a little bit there. Uh, okay. We got a long way. Uh, was, uh, Still with me? Our connection is unstable. Yeah, it's good. So, so go back. I missed the part. Uh, who was interviewing you? Can you repeat that part? Uh, Leon Van Spaybrook, what uh, oh, okay. wonderful guy. Okay. Um, he's sorely missed now. Anyway, uh, they put me to work on an, the orbiting geochemical package for a, a Apollo 15 and 16. Very nice, very nice. The, the astronauts, you know, one of them stayed up in that mm -hmm. command module, so they asked for something to do <laughs> while the other two were down having fun on the surface. Yes, Cooper. Mm -hmm. So this group was involved in uh, uh, actually two of the experiments in that package. I was put to work on the alpha particle spectrometer. Um, and we had the, the only actual measurement of lunar atmosphere at that time. Yeah. Uh, 37 atoms of radon. <laughs> okay. Okay. What that demonstrated was that there's current uh, volcanic activity on the moon because radon only has a very short half life. It's very active. Yep. yep. Uh, awesome. It was fun mission. It was fun work. Awesome. Uh, anyway, a year after that, an opportunity came up when Skylab was launched. Mm -hmm. Uh, Skylab was the first U.S. space station. Uh, at the end of it, where the uh, lunar module would go, uh, they built uh, a bunch of solar telescopes, the Apollo Telescope Mount, it was called. And there was an X-ray telescope. Uh, and they needed somebody to uh, help work on the data that would come down from that mission. Uh, the data being a 1,000 foot canister of 70 millimeter film, which was retrieved by an astronaut on a spacewalk. Wow. Down to the ground. So that's how I got into solar physics. Wow. And in particular, X ray uh, observations of the corona. Wow. That is. And uh, that's pretty much what I've been doing ever since. Very cool. So did um, did that work result in your first double AS journal paper, APJ, AJ? It was, yes. I had been publishing in FizRev and FizRev letters before that. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when the data came down, uh, we had all these pictures, rows and rows of pictures. We plastered the wall with them and the head of the group uh, had us all walk around with him and look at the pictures and he, he was handing out assignments. And one thing we saw on these new x-ray images was that there were little features in the corona uh, that were sort of scattered all over the place. 
And I commented, well, you know, if they're uniformly distributed, you'd see more of them at the edges of the image, you know, like craters on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's what I got assigned to work on. <laughs> Volunteered. <laughs> so right. that, was the, that resulted in my first paper in AppJ. Very cool. So we will, uh, we will put a link to that paper in the description below the video. <clears throat> we'll just put a link to that paper below the video. So very good. Uh, so what is what is your what is so after you publish your first double H journal article, what's been your history with the journal since then? Uh, I looked up the number. I in AppJ, which is mainly where solar physics papers go and where mainly where I've been publishing. Uh, I, I have 108 AppJ papers. Um, of course, there's a lot of years there. Sure. <laughs> 108 of papers takes a while. <clears throat> Very good. Um, so when, when did you so in that long 108 paper streak, when did you decide to become a scientific editor? Okay, that was back when, it, when AppJ was separate. This was before the uh, changeover to uh, AAS journals. Uh -huh. And uh, the way it came about, uh, one of my colleagues was stepping down as editor and recommended me. So uh, I talked with Ethan, okay. uh, the editor in chief, uh, and I became an SE. Uh, I did two three year terms, so six years in total. Uh, I got very busy. Uh, building and operating some space missions. So I had to step down after six years. Okay. Uh, I actually nominated my colleague, Ed DeLuca. Mm -hmm. He took over as, as uh, SE. Yep. Uh, and then after a few years, uh, he said that there was going to be this change that they were introducing this uh, additional layer of lead editors and the journals would be combined into this larger rubric. And he suggested that I might want to uh, be a lead editor. So I contacted Ethan and I came back in this new role. And that was... Uh, can't remember how many years ago that was. 2016, I believe. <clears throat> Sounds was, about right. That was 2016 when the, the lead editor structure went in. So, so, so let me ask, what does, uh, what does a lead editor do? <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess the reason for this extra um, level of editors I, is uh, the job became too big for mm. one editor in chief to handle. Right. Um, so the lead editors um, each handles a, a corridor, as it's called. Uh, the one I do is the solar and heliospheric physics. Okay. Corridor. And uh, in a sense, I do for that corridor what the lead, what the editor in chief used to do uh, for the journal as a whole. Um, papers come in to me at, every day. It's, uh, in fact, you know, the job is nonstop. It's always there and it follows you everywhere you go. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Mm. So as the papers come in, um, I assign them or take them on myself. I assign them to other SEs. Okay. There are three 
uh, solar and heliospheric SEs, but really uh, any of the LEs can assign a paper to any of the SEs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it really is just a question of what's consistent with what that SE, uh, you know, what their field is and what they, what they, they, they specialize in. Uh, I'm often asked to be an SE from people in other corridors as well. Oh, uh, well, thanks for spilling that. <laughs> I have an idea because I do get I do get quite a number of um, plasma orientated uh, toward the sun, even sometimes submissions because people put it under the fundamental physics banner. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave that as it is right now. <laughs> so we do have some overlap on, on some of, and that's true in general of all the LEs. There's always some overlap uh, generally between fields. So um, LEs will swap papers back and forth or ask them to be SEs. Um, so, so roughly roughly on average, how many, how many new submissions per week do you handle? It fluctuates enormously. Uh, Average is about 20 a week okay. in this corridor. It's almost never less than 10 a week. And there have been times when it's gone up to 40. Ooh. Those are rare. <laughs> it distributed at the edges. <laughs> yes. uh, so, so, uh, so then you distribute those. And so some of those you take as, as SC. Um, and so, so what do you think makes for a good, solid initial submission? I would say that the most important thing is um, to understand what it is you have to tell people. Uh, I think that the most important uh, course that I took uh, in helping me write good scientific papers was a course in journalism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there you learn what's your headline. Yeah. What's the hook? And if you have something to say, say it up front and be clear about it and don't throw in a lot of extra stuff. Very good. That is sage advice. For authors out there, that's you. Uh, okay. So you look as a scientific editor, you take a look at the paper, see if they are got their hook, they're telling it clearly. Uh, and then it goes out for peer review. And then authors get the get the report back. And so do you have any do you have any tips for authors about the peer review process itself? Yes, quite a few actually. Okay. Uh, one is to keep in mind that the reviewer is really doing you a good turn by commenting on your paper. Mm -hmm. um, in extreme cases, I've had to tell people, you know, this might might be the only person who actually reads your paper. You should appreciate it. <laughs> good, good, yeah, yes. I haven't had to do that often. Um, but I encourage authors to welcome the input from the reviewer. Uh, they very rarely are biased or um, uh, they don't. They don't intend to be vindictive or unnecessarily harsh. They're, they're giving you an honest opinion and uh, preventing you from making mistakes before things are published. Right. Very good. Yep. Um, and in replying to an author, I would. I always urge. Uh, politeness in both directions. 
Yes. It, 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 it accomplishes nothing to get angry and upset and make accusations. It, it uh, at a minimum, it just slows everything down. Yes, it does. <laughs> so, you know, take what the reviewer says uh, in a good spirit and reply in the same way. That's my advice. Excellent. Thank you, Leon, for that advice. How about the other side of the game? Um, referees. Do you have any tips or guidance for referees on writing report or replying to an author reply or general just guidance for referees? The guidance would be similar. Um, you know, certainly insulting the author is a very bad idea. And I, I tend to uh, actually send a report back and ask for it to be rewritten if it's really hostile and negative. Uh -huh. um, for younger reviewers, there we go. I, I find, yeah, beginners, they don't necessarily have to be young, but I find that they often make the mistake of trying to rewrite the paper for the author. Right. And, you know, first of all, that, that, that's not your job. You don't, you don't have to do it. Um, the, you know, the, to me, the main job of the reviewer is to uh, find, point out errors if there are any, um, help the author if uh, there are areas that are unclear but, you know, point them out. You don't have to rewrite it. Right. You're not um, <laughs> in other words, don't make the job harder than it is already. You know, there... Yep. Indeed. Okay. Cool. Is there anything else uh, you'd like to share about the editorial process from data editors to managing office to anything else? Yes, that's true. Um, authors may not know, there are also data editors who, uh, especially in the solar area, mm. uh, authors can often benefit from their advice on how to present your data and what format to put it in and how to make it available to people. So uh, I guess about one third, one fourth of the papers get a data editor review along with the uh, uh, regular review. And uh, the authors uh, should treat that as another review. and and treat it with the same uh, seriousness. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I, I think I've said everything I can think of to say about the review process. Okay, that's great. Leon, I wanna thank you so much for spending some time and chatting with us about your, uh, your research, your experience with the journals and your roles as a scientific and lead editor. So thank you. Thank you for having me here. All right, everyone, thank you so much and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.